Welcome to this NANSIG educational video on ischemic stroke. My name is Katie Lloyd and I'm a final year medical student at the University of Bristol. This video has been produced with the guidance of Dr Alvaro Severa, a consultant neurologist specialising in stroke at Southmead Hospital in Bristol. The overriding aim of this video is to provide an overview on ischemic stroke for final year medical students. Specifically, it will cover the background of ischemic stroke, its risk factors, clinical presentation, including different systems used for classifying stroke, investigations in acute stroke, the management of stroke with emphasis on reperfusion therapies, and it will finish with discussion of complications following stroke, particularly stroke-associated infections. This video also draws from the current literature to provide evidence-based perspectives on this topic. Stroke is defined as the rapid onset of clinical signs of focal disturbance of cerebral function, which lasts for more than 24 hours or results in death with a vascular origin. This definition separates stroke from transient ischemic attacks, which have a duration of less than 24 hours. The vascular origins of stroke include inadequate blood supply to part of the brain or spinal cord, which are ischemic strokes and make up 85% of cases, or hemorrhagic strokes, which make up the remaining 15% and describe spontaneous hemorrhage into part of the brain, known as primary intracerebral hemorrhage, or hemorrhage over the surface of the brain, subarachnoid hemorrhage. This presentation will focus on ischemic stroke alone, as they're responsible for the vast majority of cases, and subarachnoid hemorrhage, a cause of hemorrhagic stroke, is covered elsewhere in NANSIG videos. Approximately 110,000 strokes occur in England alone each year, with an incidence of around one per thousand people. The incidence and mortality of stroke have shown decreases over the last decade, but stroke remains an important cause of death and disability, making it a relevant topic for medical students and doctors working in the NHS. The vascular risk factors associated with stroke, as with heart disease, are well described. However, a recent international case control study named Interstroke has provided a more evidence-based outline of these risk factors. The study suggested that 10 key modifiable risk factors, which are listed here, are responsible for 90% of the population attributable risk, meaning that the incidence of stroke would decrease by 90% if exposure to these 10 risk factors was entirely removed from the population. Targeting these factors is therefore an important part of stroke prevention. Other risk factors are likely genetic, and certain polymorphisms, including PITX2, have been identified as increasing a person's risk of stroke. Stroke usually presents with the acute onset of anatomically localising symptoms, which are symptoms which have a clear anatomical origin caused by ischemia to a certain brain area. For example, ischemia of the corticospinal tract resulting in unilateral weakness, unilateral sensory loss due to ischemia of the spinothalamic tract, or cerebellar signs such as ataxia from ischemia of the cerebellum. These anatomically localising symptoms can occur in isolation or in combination. Atypical stroke presentations include positive symptoms such as movement disorders from ischemia to the basal ganglia or neuropsychiatric disturbances. As well as the combination of anatomically localising symptoms, the vessel which is occluded in ischemic stroke can also be used to classify the clinical presentation. The vessel involved determines which area of the brain or spinal cord is deprived of blood and therefore has altered function, which subsequently determines the combination of anatomically localising signs which will result. A final classification of stroke is the Oxford Stroke Prognosis Classification, which is also known as the Bamford Classification. This characterises stroke based on whether they involve the anterior or posterior circulation. Tax and PAX are anterior strokes, and here anterior denotes vessels supplied by the internal carotid arteries, including the anterior cerebral and middle cerebral arteries. Whereas pox is a posterior circulation stroke and denotes vessels supplied by the vertebral arteries. 
the clinical presentation and subsequent classification also allows a prediction to be made of whether the occlusion is in a small or large vessel. For example, a tax, a total anterior circulation stroke, has more extensive symptoms and therefore is predictive of occlusion of a larger, more proximal vessel than a PAX, a partial anterior circulation stroke, which has only two components of a tax and is therefore likely to be caused by occlusion of a smaller or more distal vessel, supplying a more restricted area of the brain. Lunar strokes, or LACs, produce a more restricted syndrome again of purely sensory, purely motor or a sensory motor hemiparesis without any higher cerebral dysfunction and this is highly predictive of small infarcts in the subcortical areas such as the basal ganglia or pons. Finally, posterior circulation stroke or POX clinically groups together strokes that involve the brainstem, cerebellum and occipital lobes, all of which are supplied by the vertebral arteries. All of these syndromes can be used to predict prognosis and outcome. TACs have the worst prognosis in terms of mortality, whereas PACs are the biggest predictor of recurrent strokes. The predominant investigation in acute stroke is brain imaging. According to NICE guidelines, imaging should be performed as soon as possible in all patients presenting with an acute stroke, or within 24 hours at the most. However, if a patient presents with any of the listed features which suggest haemorrhage, or if thrombolysis is indicated, brain imaging should be performed immediately, which is either the next available slot or within an hour. As the effect of thrombolysis is time dependent, patients in whom thrombolysis is indicated must be imaged immediately to exclude haemorrhage before the treatment can be given. The brain imaging used in acute stroke is non-contrast cranial CT, which has near-perfect sensitivity to detect fresh intracranial haemorrhage, but its sensitivity for diagnosis of ischemic stroke is poor if the ischemia is recent, small, or in the posterior fossa. Based on the fact that CTs are performed as soon as possible, the role of cranial CT scans in acute stroke is therefore to rule out haemorrhage or other causes of the symptoms, such as a space-occupying lesion as opposed to diagnosing ischemic stroke directly. CT angiogram is also used if patients are suitable for vectomy, which will be discussed later on in this presentation. The first stage of the NICE guidelines for the management of acute stroke is admission to a specialist stroke unit. This describes a ward which exclusively cares for patients who've had a stroke and is provided by a specialist multidisciplinary team. A Cochrane review in 2007 showed that patients who were treated on such a ward have a better outcome including death, dependency and institutionalised care. Other initial steps include the use of reperfusion therapies including thrombolysis or mechanical clot retrieval. Antiplatelet treatment is commenced following exclusion of hemorrhagic stroke. 300 mg of aspirin given within 24 hours and continued for two weeks when long-term antithrombotic treatment should be initiated which is usually clopidogrel. The multidisciplinary team on the specialist unit, including physiotherapists, occupational therapists and speech and language therapists, ensure early swallowing assessment and mobilisation are achieved. As already mentioned, reperfusion therapies are used in the management of acute stroke. The aim of these therapies is to restore blood flow to the ischemic area. The rationale behind this is to prevent damage to the penumbra which is the area of damage surrounding the core infarct. Unlike in the area of core infarction, the damage in the penumbra is dynamic and develops over time involving complex apoptotic pathways. Intervening early to produce reperfusion of the area can therefore limit the damage to surrounding structures and produce better outcomes. This time-dependent effect is shown here in this graph, where a shorter onset to start of treatment is associated with better outcomes at three months compared to more delayed treatment. Reperfusion can be achieved by either thrombolysis or clot retrieval. Thrombolysis uses the recombinant tissue plasminogen activator, alteplase to convert plasminogen to plasmin, the enzyme responsible for clot breakdown. This is given to patients who present within 4.5 hours and in whom hemorrhage has been excluded. Clot retrieval is a newer method which is less well known amongst medical students. 
a catheter is inserted into the femoral arteries and advanced to the cerebral vasculature via the carotid arteries. Once the catheter is on the clot, a stent is deployed and then retreated, which brings the clot with it and restores blood flow. In a study by Goyal et al. 2016, data from five randomised control trials was collaborated to assess the outcomes following thrombectomy. Patients who presented within 12 hours of symptom onset were randomised to receive either thrombectomy or the best available medical treatment. The results showed that endovascular clot retrieval improves the odds of a better outcome following stroke, defined as reduced disability at 90 days. This improved outcome included patient groups in whom alteplase was indicated, suggesting that thrombectomy may produce better outcomes than alteplase. And it also showed improved outcome in the patient group in whom alteplase was not indicated, including those presenting between 300 minutes and 12 hours, which could suggest that thrombectomy may be beneficial in patient groups in whom alteplase is not licensed. Once a patient has suffered an acute stroke, they are at risk of complications, the common of which are listed here. Brain edema is managed surgically using hemicraniotomy. The other complications are medical and should be managed urgently as they can alter prognosis, such as stroke-associated infections, which will be discussed on the next slide. Prevention of complications following stroke includes the use of flotrons, or intermittent pneumatic compression, to prevent DVT or PE. TED stockings are not used following acute stroke. The levels of infections, such as respiratory tract and urinary tract infections, are higher in patients who've had a stroke than in other hospital patients. The cause of this is likely multifactorial, including immune suppression seen following brain injury. This increased rate of infection is important because of its relationship with stroke outcome. Stroke patients with pneumonia have a mortality rate of 27%, compared with 4% in stroke patients without pneumonia. Patients with stroke-related pneumonia survive show significantly decreased functional ability following stroke. Based on this, treatments to prevent stroke-related infections have been researched, including prophylactic antibiotic treatment in patients following an acute stroke. But evidence of this is not clear, and so it's not included in NICE guidance. The use of antibiotic treatment for established stroke-related infections, however, is indicated. To summarise, strokes can be either ischemic or hemorrhagic, with ischemic strokes making up 85% of cases. Despite a fall in the incidence and mortality of stroke over the last decade, stroke is still a major cause of death and disability. Most risk factors for stroke are modifiable, which makes preventative medicine an important part of stroke medicine, although some genetic risk factors have been identified. Strokes present with acute onset symptoms, which depend on the location of the stroke, and are therefore anatomically localising. The main investigation is cranial CT, which is performed as soon as possible in all patients with a suspected stroke. The management is multidisciplinary and involves the use of reperfusion therapies, which are important time-dependent options to limit damage to the area surrounding the infarct, known as the penumbra. That's the end of this video. Thank you for watching. I hope it has been useful.